Well, welcome everybody. I'm David Kennedy, a emeritus member of the faculty in this department, PISTRI, and former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And the History Department and the Bill Lane Center are the joint sponsors of this series of lectures in Western history. And as those of you who've been here before have heard me say, our main purpose is to bring to the broader Stanford community some of the richness and the dynamism that exists in the broader field of Western history, which I uh, keep reminding people has long been a pillar of this department's uh, focus, going all the way back to Edgar Eugene Robinson, who was a faculty member in the early 20th century, was the last student of Frederick Jackson Turner, and through David Potter, who wrote on the Oregon Trail, Don Fehrenbacher, who wrote on the history of California, and right down to our most recent Western historian, Richard White. So we have a long tradition in this department of taking our region uh, seriously. And I might note in passing, or maybe not so much in passing, that the Lane Center, jointly with the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, or CEPR, will be uh, sponsoring a conference on May 19th on campus. It will take place in the CEPR building. The generic title for the gathering is North American Borders, or North American Neighbors. We're going to have two panel discussions through the afternoon, one on the present and future status of the USMCA, and the second on the southern border crisis that we read about virtually every day uh, in the newspaper. And Alberto Diaz is one of the people who helped us to organize that. And what did I just do to the electronic system here? May 19th, if you're interested, a day's worth of discussion of the USMCA, the successor to NAFTA, and the southern border crisis. Today, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Andres Resendez, uh, who is yet another son of the West uh, in this series, although it's by an elastic definition of the West that we count you because you were raised in Mexico, right? So Andres was educated at, at the Colegio de Mexico. He took his PhD at the University of Chicago. He's taught at Yale and University of Helsinki. He's currently on the faculty at UC Davis. Uh, and Andres has written a, several books on an impressive range of subjects from Southwest Borderlands to Pacific Ocean Exploration, and my favorite among his several titles, uh, entitled The Other Slavery, The Uncovered Story of Indian Enslavement in America, which won the 2017 Bancroft Prize. So today, Andres will be talking to us on the Magellan Exchange, How America and China Have Made Each Other. Andres. Thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you. Um, it is a, a privilege to be here, um, and I should say that this is uh, really a, an, a book project in the beginning, so any comments, any questions, any criticisms are most welcome. This is the time to do that. Uh, beginning with the title, I feel uh, that the title does not justice to what I'm doing, um, but so let me uh, sketch out the, you know, the, the broad outlines of the project and, uh, and then get into some conversation. So I'll start out by saying that when we think of uh, long-lasting connections between East and West, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, the Silk Road. Um, a recent Chinese initiative makes very clear the Silk Road uh, continues to serve as a powerful signifier of relations across the globe. But uh, there has been another historic point of contact between East and West, and this one across the Pacific. It is far, far less known than the Silk Road, uh, yet, as I will try to show uh, in the next few minutes, um, it is uh, more consequential to us, of course, here in the Americas, to East Asia and to the world, to the world at large. Uh, the, that is the remit that we'll, we'll try to, uh, to, to do. Uh, this exchange across the Pacific has been continuous and has lasted close to 500 years by now. And the first half of this, so the first two and a half centuries of this exchange, were pretty much courtesy of the Spanish Empire. So as many of you know, or most of you or all of you know, uh, in the middle of the 16th century, Spain pioneered a route across the Pacific, back and forth across the Pacific. Uh, quite a difficult undertaking and a great uh, adventure, which is the subject of my previous book, um, and it was also a major milestone because, I mean, let's, let's face it, for tens of millions of years, 
the Pacific Ocean has been an insurmountable barrier to the movement of plants, animals, humans, objects, and ideas. And this barrier suddenly um, came down in 1565. This episode occurred in 1564, 50, And from then on, galleons sailed every year, or almost every year. So we're talking about over 700 galleons over the course of 250 years, some of them as big as uh, over 1,000 tons of burden. Uh, so a lot of stuff could fit into those galle galleons. Now, sailing across the Pacific is difficult, so galleons had a very established route. I want to take just a minute to talk about the mechanics of these routes, just, uh, just so that you get a sense, and because some of these will become important for the future discussions. So the, uh, the galleon departed from the port of Acapulco. Unfortunately, my uh, pointer does not show in this television for reasons, technological reasons that elude me. But here we go from, the, uh, from Acapulco and on the Mexican coast and crossed all the way, four-fifths of the way to Guam, uh, which you can't quite see there, but we are talking about somewhere here. So Guam is the largest island of a chain, north-south chain called the Mariana Islands. Um, and so that's where the, uh, the galleon stopped. Um, not a very convenient stop. I mean, Hawaii would have been much better, but uh, it was not discovered by Europeans until the late 18th century by Captain Cook. So, they, uh, so then they got to the Philippines, and from the Philippines, they uh, began the return. So the, first of all, the, the, the way there was done with favorable winds and currents, and it usually take three months, sometimes four months for some climatological changes in the 17th century. The way back took uh, six to eight months, so it's a lot more difficult. They had to go way north, as you can see from the route, um, and uh, they really, after departing the, uh, the archipelago in, uh, in the Philippines, they would not see any speck of land on the siding the American continent uh, all the way. So, uh, so this uh, galleons, as I said, made an estimated 788 individual voyages over the course of 250 years, carrying untold goods, plants, animals, and humans, and Acapulco and Manila themselves, they may not seem, sound like much, so Acapulco has surely seen better days, and, uh, and you know, Manila is a fine city, but people, when we think about great cities in that part of the world, we may think of other cities, um, but, uh, but they were truly uh, continental funnels, meaning that uh, merchants, from all over the Americas sent goods or gathered in Acapulco to, to trade across the Pacific, and the same thing happened at the other end. Now, uh, if we focus for a moment on Guam, this is a, an illustration from a beautiful 18th century map, uh, we can get a first inkling of the ecological power of these Magellan Exchange that I'm talking about. It was uh, the only regular stepping stone on the enormous ocean and uh, although the galleons bar barely spent a day or two there, so just enough to top off provisions, get some additional water, and deliver the mail, the ecological consequences were truly devastating. So Guam is more than 7,000 miles away from the coast of North America, yet fully one-third of the invasive plant species in Guam today are from around here. Uh, from around the coast of Mexico uh, or from parts of what is now the western coast of the United States. The most abundant plant, the single most abundant plant in central and northern Guam today is probably a tree originally from Mexico, uh, the uh, Leucaena leucocephala. Um, and the Spanish galleons also introduced hoofed animals. They introduced pigs, uh, which are very highly um, adaptable uh, domestic animals. They reproduce very fast, and when they escape, they become feral. And so with no natural predators, pigs literally took over Guam. And as recently as 2002, an estimated 38 feral pigs per square kilometer still existed on the island. So it's still a problem to this very day, even though they were introduced in the late 17th century when uh, the Spanish decided to permanently occupy this island. Most dramatic of all, of course, 
was the arrival of new vectors of disease in the form of rodents and insects. Uh, scholars have yet to write a comprehensive environmental history of one, but it is obvious that in the decades uh, following Spain's permanent occupation of the island in the late 17th century, that they were truly catastrophic for the native islanders known to the Spanish as chamorros. So they numbered in the tens of thousands. We don't really have a precise figure, but that's what Magellan, so Magellan in 1521, when he and his crew essentially stumbled on this island, they talked about the population briefly and they estimated the population at tens of thousands. Uh, by 1710, uh, there were only about 3,000 of them according to a pretty exhaustive Spanish census. And one decade later, another census put that number in half. So really, it was cataclysmic for the indigenous population of this island. And so one really offers an early illustration of the destructive, the incredible destructive and awesome power of this Magellan Exchange. But it was not all about destruction. It was also about transformation. And so, uh, so the next point that I would like to make is that very highly productive American plants, especially corn and sweet potatoes, but we could talk about others. We could talk about peanuts, we could talk about uh, tobacco, etc. truly transformed East Asia. Between the 16th and the 20th century, corn spread to every single province in China and nearly every single sub-provincial unit or prefecture. So here are some, uh, it, you, we have very good information about plants in China because of the local histories that were uh, published and republished in various prefectures. And so you have almost real time information about the availability of different plants and foodstuffs in different markets in different parts of China. And so this is how we can actually track the diffusion of, a, of an American plant 500 years ago. Otherwise, we would have no idea. And as you can see, uh, corn literally took over. Um, corn was especially revolutionary because it opened a new agricultural frontier in China by allowing farmers to settle mountainous regions that were not suitable for rice cultivation or wheat cultivation. And so in the 16th and much of the 17th centuries, China still possessed extensive forests, and many of them were cut down in the 18th century to make room for cornfields. Corn is uh, a remarkable plant. It's a little bit of a monster of a plant. It you know, domesticated in the Americas for over 9,000 years. If you look at the uh, ancestor to uh, corn, uh, Teosinte, looks nothing like corn, so clearly Native Americans uh, really transformed these grass beyond recognition, made it super highly productive. Corn does not reproduce on its own. It requires human intervention. It does not exist in the wild. Uh, but through this partnership with humans, corn essentially uh, covered uh, much of the American continent, adapted to very different, uh, you know, from tr tropical areas to very desert uh, like areas like the Southwest, from very high mountainous regions to very to lowlands, and and corn did the same thing in China. Um, it uh, it was very well adapted for mountain cultivation, as it is a very deep rooted plant that is not easily washed away by rains. Um, and corn is also happens to be very versatile uh, in that it can be consumed directly by humans, or it could be used as animal feed. So you can transform corn into, into bacon, for example, or, or, or pig meat, um, or it could be uh, fermented, or it could be, um, so, or it could be stored. So clearly, uh, it's a very, very versatile kind of a food. And uh, China's largest crop by volume today is not rice, a uh, crop that is almost synonymous with Chinese civilization today, but it, it is corn. Uh, in China, it remains underappreciated and even invisible, uh, but corn is nonetheless used there primarily as animal feed. Uh, today, as China's rapid urbanization has increased demand for animal protein, uh, for which corn is an input, or it is also used as an input in vast supply chains to make alcohol or sweeteners or other industrial purposes. Um, Corn from the American continent has truly transformed China over the last half a millennium. 
And something similar can be said of the humble uh, sweet potato. So uh, sweet potato is a vine that was domesticated in South America, in the northern part of South America, some four or 5,000 years ago. Um, and it is really a marvel to behold. Uh, if humans had to survive on a single food source, potatoes, the regular potatoes, would be a good choice. As we all know, those of you who saw the film The Martian, uh, Matt Damon survived only on potatoes. Uh, I don't mean to be uh, picayune about it, but Matt Damon would have been a little better off if he had survived on sweet potatoes rather than potatoes because of its higher content of vitamin A and a little bit higher content of calcium. So the um, entire plant is edible. Uh, so the leaves, the stems, and of course the very nutritious tuberous root, which is uh, a bomb of, uh, of, of calories. So it has carbohydrates, but it has some protein as well, and it has some, uh, some fat. It is extremely easy to propagate by cutting pieces of these tuberous root, or even by cutting pieces of the stem. Um, uh, and it is extraordinary resistance, resistant to insect infestations, and it does extremely well in hurricanes and typhoons, which was a really big deal in some parts uh, of, of East Asia. So in East Asia, sweet potatoes became the ultimate vegetable insurance against, uh, uh, against many of these terrible storms. Uh, so for example, in the late 19th century, when for example, uh, the Japanese started taking uh, uh, food surveys of the island of Okinawa, for example, in some parts of Okinawa, uh, up to 90 or more percent of the calories ingested by some regions of Okinawa came exclusively from sweet potatoes, which is uh, pretty extraordinary. It had to do, again, with the typhoon sweeping through the area um, fairly, uh, fairly frequently. Um, what is more, uh, the Chinese imperial government purposely, very deliberately, used sweet potato as a tool to combat droughts and floods, the two most common environmental disasters in China. Um, as, an econ as economist Rui Shui Jia has shown. And so these highly productive New World crops were catalysts for China's population. So again, I'm not saying that this is the only thing that led to China's population expansion, but you can see that the inflection point in the 17th and 18th century is occurring precisely as these very highly productive American plants are expanding at a rapid clip uh, through China. Um, and of course, there were other factors going on. There was uh, acquisition of more land uh, or uh, better ways for the Chinese imperial government to manage uh, food crisis. But even in these aspects, uh, these new uh, world crops ha were implicated. So as I was saying, uh, corn opened up a new agricultural frontier by allowing the you know, the inclusion of, of wood areas as part of the, uh, of the um, arable land of China, or, um, or uh, being tools for combating environmental disasters as the Chinese very self-consciously and increasingly did with the sweet potato. Okay, so, so far we have talked about the New World Plan shifting China's demographic trajectory. Uh, but transformation, of course, went both ways across the Pacific and China's large and expanding population during the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries could not help but cause ripple effects um, across the ocean. And so the best known example, as many of you around in this room and elsewhere will know, um, is that of silver. So China was one of the first countries in the world to use fiat money, so little pieces of uh, of worthless pieces of paper uh, or bills that were valuable only because the government said that they valued, they, they valued, uh, they, they, they were valuable. And this remarkable monetary system, however, ran into trouble in the 15th and 16th centuries. And so um, China ultimately um, replaced paper money with silver as a means of exchange and as a store of value. And so the empire 
uh, the Chinese Empire possessed some silver mines, which initially helped the, with the initial silverization of China, but uh, their output was not nearly enough to support this sudden and uh, massive shift towards the white metal. And thus, China began importing vast quantities of silver from the outside, first from neighboring Japan, but ultimately from the American continent, uh, which had the largest silver deposits in the world. Again, as, as many of you know, between 1500 and 1800, the American continent produced anywhere between 75 and 85 percent of the world's uh, output of silver. Whoa. And uh, all of this silver, uh, or not all of this silver, but you know, a good proportion of this silver wound up in China. Uh, this flow of silver from the rest of the world, and especially from the Americas to China, went uh, via two ways. Uh, one was directly across the Pacific through these Manila galleons. So uh, the saying in colonial Mexico was that the Manila galleons left with only friars on silver. Uh, friars for the Philippines and silver for China. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about what, they, what it returned with. Um, and uh, the other route was indirectly. Um, and again, the story that we are told when we are growing up in Mexico, for example, and Alberto won't let me uh, uh, lie here, is that uh, the Europeans conquered Mexico and then they took all the silver uh, and took it to Europe. But in fact, this was only an intermediate step because from Europe, through additional European intermediation, particularly by the British and the Dutch, the silver continued to flow into India and ultimately into uh, China. Uh, as I said, much of, these, of the silver through both of these uh, flows ended up in China, where silver attained the highest price anywhere in the world. So, uh, so during the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, the you know, the uh, uh, profits to be made were simply arbitrage, meaning that you, if you had silver here in the Americas, you could sim simply silver, uh, sell it in uh, China for double the price that was here. And just by virtue of moving it there, you would double your investment. Economic historians sometimes refer to China as the silver sink of the world. But here I would like to briefly talk about the silver tap uh, that is the American continent. And the point, that I'm, the point that I'm trying to make here is very simple. Without China's massive and long-lasting demand for silver, the American mines would never have attained the scale that they did. The largest one was the mine of Potosí in the Viceroyalty of Peru, as all of you undoubtedly know. And at its peak in the early 17th century, this remote and forbidding mountain in the Andes produced as much silver as all the other silver mines in the world combined. People flocked to this mountain of silver, creating an instant city that reached up to 160,000 people, uh, inhabitants, uh, one of the largest cities in the early modern world, incongruously living at more than 13,000 feet in elevation. So think about this. It is, I mean, if we put it in our own context here, or your own context here is as if the entire population of Palo Alto, Menlo Park, and much of Redwood City would move to some of the highest elevations of the California Sierras. Uh, this is what it took. Mexico also developed uh, some many silver mines. So Mexico uh, never uh, had a, you know, a, a mine on the scale of Potosí, but five very large mines two dozen fairly large mines and dozens of silver strikes propelled Mexico into becoming the largest, single largest producer of silver in the world, so that by the second half of the 18th century, um, these cluster of Mexican mines that you're seeing on your screen produced about consistently about 80, I mean, I'm sorry, about half of all the silver on Earth uh, by the second half of the, uh, of the 18th century, as I was saying. So had China decided to use gold rather than silver, and it is entirely possible because China had actually used gold uh, you know, in its long history as a, as a medium of exchange and store of value, then the history of the world would have been radically different, right? I mean, West Africa would have experienced the massive boom or perhaps the gold rushes that unfolded in California and Australia in the 19th century would have unfolded in the 16th and 17th centuries. As it was, China's decision to use silver as a means of exchange, 
turned colonial Latin America into a gigantic silver extracting operation with consequences that are visible even today. Now, um, at the start of this presentation, I mentioned that the first 250 years of these Magellan Exchange across the Pacific were courtesy of the Spanish Empire through the Manila Galleon. But the last 250 years have been the courtesy primarily, though not exclusively, of the United States. Uh, the United States erupted into the Pacific in the late 18th century. It was the last major entrance into these ongoing Pacific drama that is concerning us today. And by then, China constituted an overwhelming 36% of the world's population. So think about that. One of every three humans alive at the time were living in China, uh, you know, which is a very large country, but as, I mean, by world standards, it's a relatively smallish part of the world, 6.2% of the inhabited, inhabitable Earth. Um, so uh, just for a sense of comparison today, China represents between 18 and 19% and uh, of the world's population. So you have to imagine a China in relative terms being twice as large as what it is today. Intriguingly, China wanted only a handful of commodities from the outside. Silver was one of them, and we've talked about it. But another one was furs. Furs of all kinds, but one of the most valuable was, the most valuable was sea otter furs, which uh, attain really extraordinary prices in the late 18th century in China and the early 19th centuries as well. Um, China's demand for furs ballooned in the course of the 18th century. And not only did China constitute the largest market for pelts in the world, but a new fashion in clothes swept through uh, the largest through China. When a new dynasty in the middle of the uh, 17th century uh, came to power, the Qing dynasty and the new rulers, the Manchus were outsiders who, as again, all of you know, came from beyond the Great Wall to the northeast of China. They uh, spoke a different language, they ate different foods, and they dressed differently. And to emphasize their equestrian roots, Manchus wore riding boots and furs. And even though with the passage of time, the new ruler rulers adapted to the Chinese majority. However, as Jonathan Schlesinger and others have shown, they also insisted on certain markers of Manchu identity uh, and wearing furs was one of them. So the effects of these sartorial choices of the new ruling elite of China had profound consequences. Um, as I was saying, one of the most prized furs in China were, and in neighboring Tibet was that of sea otters. Now, sea otters have the densest fur of any species on Earth. Uh, here you can see uh, a map of their, uh, their range. And initially, sea otters flowed in China from the Asian side of the North Pacific, from places like the Kuril Islands or from uh, the, the coast of Japan, um, Korea. But starting in the 1740s, they also started flowing from the American side of the Pacific. And so China's vast gravitational pull and this desire for furs initially began by affecting Native Americans who for thousands of years had been hunting sea otters. Native American hunters targeted a string of sea otter colonies that range from the Aleutian Islands that you can see there, all the way down to the Baja California Peninsula in what is now Mexico. These animals may have numbered a quarter of a million people based on carrying capacity and modern day estimates. So very large numbers, but not infinite. Um, and suddenly these animals commanded very high prices in China. Thus, beginning in the 1740s, Russian, Spanish, and British traffickers appeared on the Pacific coast of North America to trade with coastal inhabitants to get their hands on some of these sea otter furs to take to China to sell. And as many scholars like Ryan Tucker Jones, Adele Ogden, David Igler, and others have shown, Americans also participated in this fur rush. And they, uh, even though they were rather late to the party, they began only in the 1780s. They came to dominate the business of faring furs across the Pacific to China. 
So they, uh, you know, broke into this, uh, into this trade and they gained majorities by the 1790s and at the dawn of the 19th century, uh, which really constituted the golden age of the sea otter exploitation, if we can call it that way. Because the United States is a continental sized nation, it is easy to take all of these for granted. And so, first of all, let me show you. So here is an image of Qianlong Emperor wearing, uh, wearing a robe uh, with a fur trim. So again, to give you a sense of how, uh, in some ways, uh, this is all uh, you know, a, a fashion uh, choice within China that is having these enormous ripple effects on the other side of the, of the ocean. As I was saying, so because the US is a continental-sized nation, it is easy to take all of this for granted. But let's consider the unlikely circumstances. So the former British colonies were numbingly distant from the west coast of America, right? I mean, we're talking about the end of the 18th century. Uh, the passage from Boston to the mouth of the Columbia River or Vancouver Island by way of South America took six to eight months aboard very small sailing vessels employed by New Englanders. Um, simply put, I mean, we can talk all along uh, about this, but simply put, that voyage uh, was more challenging than, saying, going to India or to China. Um, and second, once American sailors reach these very godforsaken coast out here where we are, they found themselves in very bad conditions. I mean, as, as all of you know, uh, this area is surprisingly cold. It has very strong winds. It is foggy. Uh, in the uh, late 18th century, there was very little by way that the Euro-American agriculturalists considered edible. Um, so, uh, so they really had, uh, you know, uh, a, a tough time. And of course, uh, coastal peoples defended their territories jealously. So, uh, so uh, despite these tremendous difficulties, starting in the late 1780s, American merchants visited the Northwest Coast and California often multiple times per year. The only reason they went to such lengths was to procure furs for the China market. And this gives us a first and very clear indication that the presence of the United States in the Pacific Basin was first, initially, determined primarily or exclusively by the China trade. And indeed, China shaped many other aspects of the, American, the initial American presence in the Pacific. For instance, although multiple American sailors visited the Northwest Coast, as I was saying, they did not sink routes out here in the 1790s or even the early 1800s. They were, above all, China traders, an activity that required not staying put in one place, but rather sailing up and down the northwest coast for pelts. So they would essentially get to a place. They would try to attract the attention of indigenous peoples living there through cannon shots or by other means. They would then trade with the locals for these sea otter pelts. And they would repeat this for 5, 10, 20 times, and then, uh, and then uh, move to Hawaii, and then from then on to, uh, to China. Instead of settling on the western coast of North America for decades, which again, it's still a little bit of a mystery, and maybe some of you may have an explanation for this, but you know, they didn't. Instead of doing that, they turned to Hawaii as their supply base and their winter residence. A startling choice, again, cons considering that uh, Hawaii lay about 2,500 miles away from the coast of North America. It's the, it was the equivalent of using the Portuguese Azores, for example, as a provisioning center to conduct business on the coast of New England, just to give you a sense of the, the scale. Surely Hawaii's warm climate, good harbors, and abundance of food enticed wary American seafarers from the Atlantic seaboard, but its strategic location between America and China mattered just as much. And it's yet another demonstration of how the China trade shaped the exact configuration of the American presence very early on uh, in the Pacific. 
finally, uh, these co constant visits to the Pacific region also sparked an interest in finding an overland route from the East Coast to the Pacific. Multiple, so we're talking about the, Lewis, the famous Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, multiple reasons impelled Jefferson and the US Congress to finance this expedition to find a path to the far west. But again, the China trade loomed large in these drive as scholars like Michael Bloch have shown. The Lewis and Clark expedition was meant at least in part to complement America's burgeoning trade in the Pacific, as is clear from its exact roots. So the expedition started in St. Louis, as you can see that in the middle of the map. This, is America's, this was America's great interior entrepot and ended on the Pacific coast at no other point than the mouth of the Columbia River, a site rich in sea otter furs that American traders had been visiting for nearly two decades by the time this expedition got underway. By opening a line of communication, an overland line of communication, uh, Jefferson intended to funnel the, four, the furs that were being collected in the upper reaches of the Missouri and the Mississippi to a port on the Pacific for shipment to the largest pelt market in the world, as I was saying, China. Meriwether Lewis, when, uh, you know, made this very clear. After returning to Washington, he confided to one of his colleagues, and I quote him, the signal advantage of the entire expedition would be the establishment of a trading post at the mouth of the Columbia River for expediting the commerce in furs to China. So this was clearly the reason. And if you look also at the contingency plans of the expedition, uh, the idea of going across the continent, I mean, it turned out to be a grueling expedition. Um, and one of the contingencies was, well, if you find some fur merchants, some Boston men, as they were called, on the other end, you can always come back by ship, uh, which again gives you a sense that they knew what, ex what was on the other side and that this was a very likely rendezvous point uh, for these expeditions. So this, so this is not, not, not a blind shot across the continent. It is a shot across the continent very deliberately to a place that had been visited before and where you could find some other compatriots with whom you could come back. Now, uh, the notion that China lured the United States westward through its trade has been in circulation for more than two centuries. Yet, owing, owing perhaps to what two historians have team termed, and I quote, the overweening devotion of our scholars to the Atlantic, we still appear unable to appreciate the tangible impact of China on the early development of the United States. Instead, the frontier experience of the United States in the 19th century has left us an inescapable narrative of incremental westward movement, first to the immediate interior of the British colonies, then over the Appalachian Mountains to what is sometimes called the quote-unquote first American frontier, later across the Mississippi River, and finally through the Rocky Mountains to out here to the far west. Lost in all of this is that at the very start of this process, in the 1780s and 1790s, uh, what we have is this breathtaking leap from the East Coast by way of South America to the other coast. The scramble for sea otter pelts attracted literally thousands of Americans to a very distant corner of North America that otherwise would have gone unvisited for decades and gave impetus to finding an overland route to that remote fur emporium. In other words, China's unrelenting demand for pelts is what initially propelled the United States into becoming a bi-coastal nation. In the absence of the China trade, it is possible, even likely, that the United States would have still eventually reached the western edge of the continent through piecemeal territorial acquisitions. But China's love for pelts greatly accelerated this process and made the early history of the United States one not only of contiguous land expansions, but also one of great leaps and Pacific imperial designs. 
Now, these are just a handful of examples of how the Magellan Exchange across the Pacific has really powerful, powerfully shaped the Americas and China. And I would like to conclude with two very brief thoughts. First, uh, we can think of the Magellan Exchange as a sibling to the better known Colombian Exchange across the Atlantic, right? Since grade school, many of us have heard about the Colombian Exchange and how the American tomatoes transformed the cultures and cuisines of Europe, like the Spanish gazpacho or the Italian pizza, or how the Peruvian potato was instrumental to the survival of the Irish, etc. Still, the signal event of the Colombian exchange was the decimation of New World indigenous populations exposed to germs for which they had no resistance. So Europeans introduced illnesses that resulted in so-called virgin soil epidemics. The Magellan Exchange, as we have explored, has its own dynamics that were strikingly different from the Colombian Exchange. Yes, Europeans introduced germs into island environments like Guam and the Philippines, but they also introduced highly productive American crops like corn, sweet potatoes, potatoes, peanuts, and others that, that drove a great population boom in China and more broadly in Asia. Today, China is the second largest producer of corn in the world, only after the United States. China and India are the top two producers of peanuts. Papua New Guineans obtain more calories per person from sweet potatoes than anywhere else in the world. So the Magellan Exchange across the Pacific was different from the Colombian Exchange across the Atlantic and had its own and strikingly different dynamics. And perhaps that's why it has taken us a little bit of time to recognize just how influential it was. The second and last point that I want to uh, make about this is that even though the story of the Magellan Exchange that I've been laying out here has to do with pioneering voyages and powerful nations, the most affected by these trans-Pacific exchanges were ordinary peoples, especially indigenous peoples. Chamorros in Guam were the ones afflicted by new diseases introduced by Europeans. Ordinary Chinese farmers adopted exotic plants like corn and sweet potatoes to survive. Native Americans and African slaves were pulled into the fast-growing silver mines of Mexico and Peru to meet China's need for silver. Coastal indigenous peoples hunted sea otters due to a change in China's fashion at show, so on. I mean, we can go on to, to the numbers. So then and now, vast exchanges affect ordinary peoples. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we have a little bit of time. If you have any comments or questions or, um, please. I had a question about coaching out the red dye uh -huh. from Ohatar that was very, a lot of was shipped to, to Spain. So do you know if any of that coaching out went the other way, like to China? Uh, yes, I do. So, and again, we have another cochinilla expert here, but uh, so, Yes, cochinilla was exported uh, to Europe, um, and cochinilla after silver was the most exported item on the Manila galleons. So yes, not only did it go, but it go in fairly substantial quantities. So granted, silver was the top export, no questions asked, but even though there's a steep you know, step down, um, cochinilla was sent to, to, to uh, the Philippines, it wound up in China, it wound up in Japan and elsewhere. Um, it is interesting to me, I looked at that very first uh, expedition that went to the Philippines and that made possible the, you know, the, the Manila Galleon. They already took uh, 50 pounds of cochineal in that very first expedition, which is extraordinary. It's a pretty substantial gamble because this is very valuable. Again, uh, I don't know, Beto might be able to tell us how much that would be worth. But clearly, this already commanded a market in Europe, and clearly the backers of this expedition, it was an expedition of discovery, but also it was a commercial expedition, and they banked on cochineal as a possible, uh, uh, so yeah. And then we have, uh, I mean, if you look into the, uh, into, for example, the Kanshi emperor, with the Chinese emperor already talks about cochineal uh, being introduced in China, the beautiful red that is coming from foreign lands. Um, 
and uh, the same thing goes for India, the same thing goes for, for Japan. So yes, it was a very, a very important export. Yeah. Can I just add, like, by the 1560s, you have reports that the Chinese are already demanding cochineal from Florence and from the courts in Europe. Uh, 1530s is when you start seeing all the shipments and uh, the Japanese samurai by the 17th century, all the reds they're using are all cochineal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's remarkable, yeah. And I've heard, again, uh, this is not my field, but now it is possible to actually determine chemically what reds are made from cochineal and what type of cochineal. So, uh, so I think in the next few years, we're gonna learn a lot about what items were made with cochineal and with other, I mean, there were other reds uh, also uh, being in circulation at this point, so yeah. We have an online question. It says, thanks for this. What are the chronological bonds of the study? When do you start? When do you end and why? Right, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. So it begins uh, in 1564, 65, which is when the, the first galleon uh, goes there and back. So it, you know, it established this trans-Pacific contact. Uh, the end is still unclear to me, but I want to go all the way to the early to the mid 19th century. So that's the parameters. It's a wide angle kind of a project. And uh, I will look at just discrete goods to organize this, um, so to make it manageable. Otherwise, I would go crazy. But that's the, that's the general idea. Yeah, thank you. Yes, one, two, three, yep. Yeah, I had a question. So you mentioned the sort of the myth that saying that you know people went west with friars and silver. I'm curious about the friars part. So, do you have a sense to how important the galleons were to spread of Catholicism came to East Asia? Uh, yeah. So, um, so of course uh, they were going initially to Manila, uh, to the Philippines. They first the Spanish established themselves first in the island of Cebu, and then they moved to uh, to Manila. Um, and they uh, are very important to my story because all of these different orders uh, established themselves in Manila. They had, they ran monasteries and nunneries and schools and hospitals. And, uh, and these uh, missionaries are the ones who are also shipping plants. Uh, so, so they are absolutely central to my story not only for spreading Catholicism, but also for the biological expansion of the Americas into this region. And then uh, the Philippines acted as, a, as, a, as, the, as the ground in which many of these plants acclimated. And then from there, they spread into China or into uh, Southeast Asia um, or India, uh, ultimately. So, uh, so yeah, so um, what can I tell you? So the, uh, there were, were they successful? Well, uh, probably far less successful than in the Americas. So basically, uh, the Philippines, as you know, it's an archipelago of over 7,000 islands. So it was a very daunting, uh, you know, experience just to try to, to do that. They had even less success trying to uh, introduce Catholicism into Japan or China. Um, but uh, but they but but they there are all these efforts to try to uh, to convert to Catholicism all of these uh, peoples around and of course uh, the Philippines itself had a very sizable Chinese population uh, that reached into 20 30 thousand people and so they had again uh, missionaries especially devoted to convert this Chinese population in Manila as well so. Uh, so central to the story for multiple reasons, um, how successful they were. Well, not as successful in this, uh, and as in the Americas, but they really were sending uh, personnel all the time. Later on, they are also sending um, vagrants and uh, children unwanted by their families, or, or, or not unwanted by their families, but children who were, uh, whose parents wanted them to be straightened out and so they were sent to the Philippines for that purpose, which to me is uh, rather extraordinary. So, uh, so that, that, also, uh, that also happened, but that was a later on in the, in the Gallium period. Yes? That was absolutely fascinating. And I wanted to touch on one thing you sort of alluded to at the end of your talk, where we have these sort of frameworks for the Atlantic world um, that are very well established at this point. We have you know, the commodities trade, coffee, sugar, later cotton, the sort of 
exchange of microbes and diseases. We is it a, a place and a process with fairly defined chronological and methodological parameters. Is there such a thing that it, you know? Is is this just basically the same thing in the Pacific? Um, or is the is the Pacific world just the same thing as that? You know, hello, we're over here. You know, where we also see commodity exchange, we see the exchange of microbes again. People, you know, we see many the same processes. Is there anything that fundamentally differentiates itself? You know, in the sort of Pacific world from the Atlantic world in the way that we think about this. And should every graduate student be doing? You know, their Atlantic world paper, but also the Pacific world paper, if they yeah. want to understand American history. Well, I'm so glad you asked this. <laughs> um, now, uh, so that's a great question. I'm still grappling with this. So I think one commonality is uh, what we have is the remarkable biological expansion of the Americas to the rest of the world, right? I mean, whether it's to Europe or to Asia, what we have are these incredible plants, uh, again, corn, sweet potato, uh, tobacco, uh, all of these plants are being expanded just so, so it's not a, an Atlantic or a Pacific story, it's a, just a worldwide story. So this is common. Where it, it is different is the effect, right? So meaning um, what I was just saying, we are, we are, we are, we have studied the Magellan exchange, the, the uh, Colombian exchange as equivalent to the exchange of microbes and the very uh, deleterious effects on the American continent. But because Europe was, Eurasia was essentially the same uh, disease pool, or that is one possibility, then the effect of Europeans coming from the Americas to the other extreme of Eurasia were vastly different. Um, so, so, so I was saying it, you know, it resulted in the decimation of one, the population of one, for example. So in some ways that is a very similar process to what occurred in the Americas, but with a half a century delay. Uh, it happened the same thing in the Philippines, which is already very close to the, to the Asian continent, in part because some of these illnesses did not become endemic in the Philippines, even though it was fairly close to Asia, it still was not Sufficient, sufficiently densely populated to turn these into, uh, into uh, endemic uh, illnesses. And so they were periodically being reintroduced so that when the European, the Spanish especially, settled themselves permanently there, uh, they result, that resulted in a very catastrophic decline, population decline in the Philippines. We don't see any evidence of that in China or Japan. And it, it may have to do with just the fact that these illnesses had become endemic uh, in, within the continent. And again, we see that with, with, the, with the Black Death, right? That it started in maybe Central Asia. Again, there's, there are different theories about that, but it moved through India to China, and then it moved into Western Europe. So clearly you see that these germs are moving through these enormous landmass. Um, and so they are part of the same disease pool, so that when new Europeans come there, it doesn't have the same impact. So, so that's probably what is different, and that needs to be explained why the effect was so different uh, there. Um, the other part uh, that is different has to do with uh, Alfred Crosby popularized this idea of the, exp the biological expansion of Europe and this, the creation of new Europes right, uh, areas especially of temperate climate that uh, were uh, European species, especially domesticated species were introduced and new plants, uh, the decimation of the indigenous population. And so uh, civilizations and societies that work similar to uh, Europe emerge in these places. And he's thinking about Australia, New Zealand, you know, Southern Argentina, et cetera. This did not occur, again, in the Philippines or China, where we don't have the emergence of neo-Europes there. Uh, interestingly, um, the Americas uh, uh, were the ones that the, the, the American biota uh, expanded there. I don't think, I wouldn't, to use the Crosbyan terminology, I don't think it created new Americas, uh, neo-Americas there. But it certainly uh, shifted populations, as, as I was uh, showing for the case of China, uh, and it certainly transformed uh, ways of making a living uh, in these uh, places. So they, they were significant enough, but not strong enough to create whole societies from, from new. So that's, I think, what's, what's different about that. Yeah. We had uh, Alberto, and then we have Antonio, and then we have Gordon Chang. Yeah, and Yes, let's go with that. I, I wonder about corn. 
So um, I don't know if we if talk too much with biologists about this, but, but they will tell you that corn is really meat back, which is a real ecosystem of biodiverse crops that all grow together. So it is chile and bean and, and everything fits. So one question I have for you is, did the Chinese adopt this or they actually did monocultures and, uh, and, uh, and, and that maybe means there's a story which is more about culture as much as about natural environment that, and, and what kind of cultural things can move with the crop or only the crop moves with the culture. And, and, and a single question is just about this specific mystery, which I think I, I, I myself have been struggling with. So the, the best thing I've read about this is the work by Mariana Favida, which I don't know if you've read, um, on, on navigation. And, but her mystery, in a way, is, is that what she shows is there was no sort of navigation role on the tipping. And that all kind of just disappears in setting. So for what's happening with the indigenous navigation, not, not the stories of, you know, Drake or, or having this going the other side or, or what's going on with the, with the, with the non-European navigators in the Pacific? Yeah. Um, okay, so let me take your first question. Um, unquestionably, uh, because uh, corn, as you know, corn by itself is a suboptimal staple. You, uh, you would still be lacking certain essen essential nutrients. And so that's why you have to combine it with chiles and with beans, or you want to make tortillas and, you know, nixtamalization is part of this process to make it more, uh, more nutrient. Um, in the case of, so I have records in the case of the Philippines, for example, that they are not doing any of these. They are not making tortillas. They are not, uh, so they are eating corn on the cob, which is a very, from a nutritional point of view, very suboptimal way to consume uh, corn. They are using corn as a backup, as a last resort in case that the, uh, especially in areas where rice cultivation is kind of marginal, then they will resort to corn as a last resort. So clearly uh, they are, um, taking advantage of corn's, you know, essentially a staying power and sheer nutrition. Uh, why exactly that happens is kind of fascinating. One possibility is that women, for example, who, are, who in the American uh, are the main preparers of corn are not traveling across the Pacific. And so maybe the technology of how to prepare corn did not travel to, or, for, I mean, so that's one thought that occurs to me, or I don't know why the, even though the plant moved, the culture associated with that food um, and how to make it better did not necessarily travel across the Pacific. Um, so again, this is something to be, uh, to be uh, discussed. Now, um, your second question about what happened to indigenous, indigenous uh, sailing, um, you, you mean in the Americas or in the, in the, in the Pacific coast of the Americas, yeah. Well, I mean, so this is something that is, that is, you know, that, that continues. So into the 18th century, you go to the Pacific Northwest and you have, uh, so I'm thinking of, I don't know if you've ever read a work by Joshua Reed, um, which is how uh, we tend to think of uh, homelands as land-based, but some of these communities in the Pacific Northwest had very clearly uh, demarcated patches of the ocean that were demarcated, that, that where they held sway. And so when uh, these British and Americans and Spaniards arrive, uh, they are entering this territory that has been traditionally part of their homeland, and they uh, essentially uh, engage these intruders and, uh, and begin a new process of uh, a new protocol, a protocol of how to deal with intruders, basically, into this space. So, so that continues into the, uh, the 18th century. So exactly where it may, I mean, I, I don't know if you're thinking more of indigenous um, uh, voyaging further south in Mexico, where, uh, where it may have stopped. It may have been replaced by these Euro the establishment of European uh, shipyards and, uh, and these uh, um, yeah, this is European shipyards uh, where it... So I, I'm aware, for example, of the literature of the Mesoamerican, uh, this is quite fascinating, so pre-contact uh, 
shipping lanes uh, further south, right in, in Oaxaca and into Chiapas, further south, and of course on the Pacific side, on the Atlantic side as well. Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah, Mariana shows that there's even a route, probably Peru, mm -hmm. uh, even trading Cochidiel, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> between Peru and, 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 uh, and Oaxaca, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is a very, so, so for that, I mean, again, I don't know. I, I, this is a, an interesting question. Um, there is also a very clear connection because of the silver connection between Peru and Acapulco. So, uh, so, so I would not be surprised if these indigenous uh, uh, shipping lanes were essentially outcompeted or replaced by European ones once these route got established, especially between Peru and Mexico, right? By way of Central America, but anyways. Sorry, uh, so yes. Yes, um, how cosmopolitan was this trade uh, across the Pacific? As I mentioned earlier, I have relatives in Baca who were the seventh of you know, sailors and mm -hmm. such, and I just wanna know yeah. uh, who were running the ships, who were doing the day-to-day -day work? Uh, where the, obviously, I don't, I don't think they were totally Iberian, but. No, 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 no. I mean, these voyages were completely uh, international. So the, the voyage that opened the, um, the Manila Galleon was completely international. I mean, there was a majority of Spaniards, what you would consider Spaniards, but even from different provinces. And back in the 16th century, they would have been farther apart. So the provincial differences would be far more pronounced than they are today. Or, uh, but uh, it contained Africans, it contained Portuguese, uh, Sp uh, French, uh, British, etc. There was very international, and they were there were also. Asian translators, um, so and a good contingent of um, of Africans as well. There were also a few women, which I couldn't really find enough about them. Um, once the Manila Galleon got established, then uh, so first of all, if if you have sailed at all, you see that no no matter your sailing experience, once you get to new waters, you really depend on local knowledge of waterways. And so you really need to hire local talent in order to do the final approaches because they know the depths and the currents, et cetera. And so very early on, uh, these Manila galleons uh, used um, people from the Philippines and people from China and from Indonesia, et cetera, as part of the crew. So these crews were, uh, were you know, so these were very international from the very beginning. And as you know all too well, many of these uh, settled First in Acapulco, but then elsewhere in other parts of the coast, uh, the western coast of Mexico, because of these regular transpacific. So, uh, a lot of the emphasis of the studies has been on the coerce. So many of these were slaves, enslaved people uh, from either the the Philippines archipelago or from farther afield, from the Indian subcontinent, uh, introduced by Portuguese merchants into Manila and then transported across the Pacific. Uh, but many of them were simply, you know, crew members who were hired uh, to, to, to navigate. And then they, some of them decided to stay in the New World and, uh, you know, settled, settled out here. So very, very international. So thank you for your question. Yes, Gordon. The, uh, the courts of Manila. So there's east-west dimension, but there's also north-south dimension. Mm -hmm. and there, I, I wonder if, well, you know, I've talked about here, but I just suggest it really... At the dimension, that dimension you talk about, of is under China, is really T for Chinese history. And that, that is the area, Danilla, and South, South Seas generally, was the first big, big sort of argon Chinese out migration. And Manila becomes, as Evelyn Hart says, it became the first Chinatown because it was so large. And so there's a very important trading dimension, a cultural dimension, that goes north south as well. Um, the second is about the Atlantic versus or Pacific world. I was saying that the big difference, at least alluded to it, is because there's China. China is so immense in the Pacific that it overshadows everything, including with this, I think you know, I, with as I write, from the very beginning of the Americans. The idea of China in the imagination was profound and was inspiring and stimulating. Uh, not just for trade, but for intellectual exchange, culture exchange, human exchange, and so forth. So I understand your focus on the biology and commerce, 
but there's a theological cultural dimension, right? Then uh, I think he's, he's critical. So like with Thomas Jefferson authorizes uh, who's part, one of the first things he says is to find overland route to the Pacific, you know, because that was key in inspiring Lewis and Clark. Going by Holtz goes all the way back to, to James Town. Uh, so those are just some great. We can talk about this more later. I know, really appreciate that some time. But, but the observation is, the question is, what was the relationship between the Spaniards, excuse me, the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese? Because the Portuguese are all in that same area. And in many ways, what you talk about, about Adri, these impacts on China mainland are also a result of Portuguese. Absolutely. Yes, no, fascinating point. Um, so uh, Spain and Portugal were complete rivals at this point. Uh, there will be a time later on when the two crowns join, as you know. Uh, but at this, uh, uh, by, by this point, I mean the mid to late 16th century, they are complete rivals. And when the Spanish are trying to uh, establish themselves initially in the island of Cebu, uh, they are seen with distrust by the islanders because the Portuguese have planted a... Um, a fabrication that the Spanish were there to enslave uh, the people. And they had themselves taken some slaves from other islands and they had said that they, they were Spanish in order to prevent the Spanish from gaining a foothold in the Philippines. So they were, uh, so clearly they were very much rivals, but it is a very complicated relationship, right? Because they were neighboring kingdoms on the, in, in, in Europe, in the Iberian Peninsula, and uh, Spain very much needed the uh, Portuguese know-how. So the, one of the things that I do in my book is that show that the pilot who pioneered these, who was able to return for the first time is a man, uh, an Afro-Portuguese man named Lope Martin. Um, so clearly Spain is constantly trying to lure uh, Portuguese talent at the same time that they are very distrustful of that. And of course the Portuguese, as you know uh, better than I do, were already established in the Spice Islands by this time, and they really wanted to jealously guard their monopoly, uh, which turned out to be very profitable, as we now know by e new economic history uh, work. Um, so, um, so yeah, one of uh, of, of complete uh, of complete rivalry. Even as the uh, the two crowns began, began, began be, you know, the joining of the two crowns. Uh, the, the, the union was not complete and the rivalry continues, uh, continued. Uh, so as you know, uh, the Portuguese were able to, uh, to request and succeeded in obtaining uh, Macau, you know, a, a place where they could trade directly on uh, the, the coast of China and Spain tried to do the same but couldn't do that. Uh, so, uh, so, so the rivalry continued there. And so that's why you have all these tens of thousands of uh, Chinese uh, merchants from Fujian, prim primarily going into, uh, into the Philippines, uh, following a trade that, as you well know, went back 500 years between uh, the Philippines and, and you know, these maritime provinces. So, uh, so yeah, that, uh, that rivalry uh, continued um, even, even under the Union. So yes, yes. Thank you for the, the fascinating talk. I also have some observations and a question. Um, so. It seems to me as if China is a rather static entity in your analysis. And kind of two examples I could point to is on the map, you have, you know, things like New Spain and then the Russian Empire, but then China, as if China is a unified nation state that doesn't have changing orders in the sky. The other example is the population chart. I mean, when I look at that, it would it would be like somebody having a population chart of the U.S. from 1776 to the present. Mm -hmm. What has happened in that time? There's been a lot of imperial expansion in that time. Um, so some examples I can point to are, for example, in the Sichuan Basin at the time of the Ming Qing transition, it's depopulated by 90%. So the Qing Empire has these imperial policies to kind of to kind of encourage re repopulation of these internal uh, internal frontiers, places like Sichuan, Hunan, Henan, etc. In addition to that, you also have 
uh, that expansion into Taiwan in 1683, in Tibet 1720, Xinjiang 1759. So we don't really get a sense of any of that. It's just that the China is this unified thing. So I guess my question is, what do you mean by China? Right. I mean, obviously, well, first of all, I should start out by saying that these uh, population, even the population estimates are hotly debated. I mean, they are many different, as you know, uh, many different sets of, so you have to, uh, you know, choose one um, set of population uh, estimates and go with that and, you know, and there are some questions. Um, yeah, so what I try to do in, what I would like to try to do in my paper is to be more nuanced about exactly what I mean by China. And it's not all of, well, first of all, uh, in some cases I do want to see all of China. So for example, the penetration of, uh, of corn, it really went through the entire, through the entire land. Um, but uh, when I'm talking about, for example, silver, um, I, uh, or, um, I'm really uh, meaning more the maritime provinces of southeastern China that are the ones that are carrying on this commerce and that are more silver-based, and especially later on by the 18th century, they are using Spanish pesos as their medium of exchange and not other parts of China that are using bronze coin, et cetera, so, uh, so, different, so different circuits. So I, I will try to differentiate that. As far as, uh, and also what you mentioned about the incredible uh, disruptive uh, Ming-Qing transition and the population collapse, that is key because, uh, again, one of the great debates about what happened to the production of silver in the Americas uh, hinges on this, right? So some of the uh, early works by Woodrow Bora, for example, is that they, they posit some sort of a depression uh, in the New World. Uh, one idea, initial idea, was it had to do with the, uh, with the population collapse in the Americas because, you know, these virgin soil epidemics that I, that I referred to reached, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they worsened, they essentially reduced the population towards the early 17th century. Uh, so they uh, somehow posit that this is probably the result of some supply side problems. But uh, as some of the work by Richard von Glan, for example, makes clear is that, well, it may well have been a demand issue and it may have to do with this, again, some estimates that I've seen is a, a, a downfall of 40 million people during this transition, which I don't know. Again, I would like to, if you know of any good uh, review of this literature, I would be very glad. Um, and, and try to go very carefully as to what exactly are the silver producers in Mexico and in Peru saying during this critical period in the middle of the 17th century. Um, so, so I, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so, so I, so I try to, I try to, to the, I don't uh, read classical Chinese and I don't speak Mandarin, so I'm, I can only do so much with the internal evidence for China, but I would very much like to take that into account as much as possible in my book. Um, so, so yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. I have a few questions also about the China part of the Magellan Exchange. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, what is flowing out of China and where is it going? Another way of asking that question is how is China affording all of the silver, all of the sea otters? Are they affording the sea otters with the silver? Um, and why isn't China colonizing the American West themselves to get these products? All right. Well, um, so we have, that's the other side of the, of the, the Manila galleons were absolutely crammed with various, with a handful of products, really. Uh, so some of, that, uh, some of that had to do with silk and, uh, and porcelain. So, um, so yeah, exactly what are they producing? So one of the, so again, this is very well known. One of the very interesting phenomena that occurred is the commercialization of certain parts of China in the 15th, 16th century. Um, I, I am quite fascinated by one interior town, Jingdezhen, uh, which is kind of like the, the pottery town. This one town 
is shipping out uh, pottery for imperial consumption. So they are, uh, and, and, and so for the, for the court in Beijing. Uh, and we're talking, they are getting orders in the order of 70,000 pieces, you know, 80,000 pieces, 20,000 pieces, et cetera. Um, at the same time, they are shipping porcelain all over the world. And this is the very emblematic uh, blue and white uh, porcelain that you find all over the Americas. So again, it has been found in Mexico City, Peru, as far as Argentina, in, uh, you know, as far as Santa Fe, New Mexico, in uh, uh, Florida. Um, you also find it in all of these 17th century painters by Dutch masters. When you have still lifes, you find that, the, that same. So, uh, so they, and they are quite able to um, take models and to adapt to the tastes and demands of different markets. So, uh, so, so this um, also is a part of the, of, of the story. So, uh, and the same thing goes with silk. I mean, silk, you think of silk as a very fluffy uh, thing, but you know, they, were, they had very highly specialized packers that could put silk in very tight bundles that were very, very heavy and put them into the, into the galleons. Um, one, uh, one interesting tidbit there is that the galleons sank at a rate that was twice as high as the Dutch uh, line. And one reason for that may have to do with overloading and with uh, the very late departure of the galleons because basically, well, I, I won't have time to explain all the, how, how the, how the galleons were, how the space was rented out in the galleons. But it was a, a very perverse uh, system in which, which delayed the departure of the galleons. And so some of them were subject to storms, to typhoons that are very common in that part of the world. And they were completely overloaded. And so that may have uh, contributed to these. So, so these goods are what China is using to pay for all the silver that is uh, imported. So that was one. And the other question was what? Why isn't China colonizing the American West? To oh. Uh, I don't know. Well, China, I mean, China is uh, getting this through intermediaries. So first it's getting it through the Russians, then through the British, the Americas. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Why is China not directly going there to get the sea otters? Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Yes. Um, so you spoke about the rivalry between Spain and Portugal. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, competition between Spain and the U.S. Um, I mean, obviously, the U.S. is a upstart nation uh, compared to Spain. But as they're establishing that route that the, or the trade that the Spanish had long established, are they competing directly with Spain? Or are they able to specialize their goods or the, the ports that they're going to? Okay, so um, let me um, show you another graph here. So Spain is uh, producing all of this silver, the Spanish Empire, it's shipping it through the Manila Galleon. The Manila Galleon, however, starts dimming in the, the, the Spanish crown essentially takes steps to uh, curtail the Manila Galleon because it's worried that it's uh, 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 draining the Spanish Empire of silver. And so, uh, um, and that, and so China still requires silver, especially the maritime regions of southeastern China um, that are by the 18th century quite dependent on the Spanish uh, pesos, the Spanish dollars, as the primary medium of exchange. And so, as you can see in this, uh, so Canton uh, is the only Chinese port open to Westerners in the 18th century. And you can see the port uh, information about silver imports. And you can see that uh, early on and going back to the 1740s, 1720s even, uh, that continental Europe, and by that I mean France and, uh, and Holland in particular, and Britain are trading places as the primary importers of silver into Canton. Uh, but the United States, even though it starts pretty late, um, very quickly 
muscles its way into this uh, market. And by the dawn of the, uh, of the 19th century, it is the primary supplier of silver to China. And uh, over the next two decades, it is supplying 97, 98% of all the silver coming through uh, Canton. So um, the United States is not producing any silver uh, to uh, any appreciable uh, degree until the Comstock load discovery of 1858. So throughout this period, it's really getting the silver from the Spanish empire. Uh, and it is acting as an intermediary, taking that silver uh, and then introducing it all the way into, into Canton. So, uh, so yeah, it's its competitor, yeah, but it's basically taking over uh, f uh, a trade that the Spanish Empire itself is limiting because of its regulation and dismantling of the Manila Galleon itself. So, yeah. Why, why the fascination with the mouth of the Columbia, which to this day is a very inhospitable place for shipping, it has to be constantly maintained by dredges and so on. It's where the Coast Guard tra trains for rough water rescue and so on. Yeah. Puget Sound, not very far away, indeed, is one of the best ports in the world. Mm -hmm. And we know that Robert Ray and the Strait of Juan de Chupa, I don't know if you got as far in it was down as Puget Sound, back Humber do. In 1792 or three, Maine to Puget Sound, maybe not the year, who thinks. Why did it take so long to figure out that that was a safer West Coast port? Well, because safety was not the primary concern. The primary concern was to get the uh, sea otters. And sea otters, again, it has to do, I'm sorry, again, it has to do with the biology of the sea otters. So the sea otters live in colonies. And they, uh, in certain places and not in others, so there are gaps. So even though I talked about a quarter of a million all the way from the Aleutian Islands down to Baja California, they, there are some gaps. So it's a string of colonies. And sea otters don't, don't venture out into the deep waters because they are unable to, to dive very deep for food. So once they get established in an island or a patch of the coast, they kind of stay there. And so, uh, so these were traders who were going to where the sea otter colonies were. And uh, you know, the mouth of the Columbia River happened to have a very large population of sea otters, and that's why it became uh, an important. But, and you're right, I mean, anybody who has been there, it's extremely treacherous, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not the, uh, uh, the ideal place. If you read um, diaries of some of these uh, sailors who are going out there, they hate the place. They say it's cold, it's terrible, there's no food. Uh, they are longing to go to Hawaii where they will top off provisions, they will wait for a little while and then they will go to, uh, to China to trade. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so, so that's, that's why the mouth of the Columbia River. They also, sorry, go ahead. What about beaver pelts? They, yeah, they are also taking other pelts as well. Um, the uh, sea otter pelts, however, were the most valuable, uh, you know, if, if you look at the, but they are taking other pelts as well and, you know, uh, fur seals as well. Um, so yeah, they are taking other pelts as well. Yes? This is probably the Davis, good question. Yeah, I, I think at the time, there was speculation that the Columbia River was going to have a link either through the Snake River or through the upper reaches of the mm -hmm. Mississippi. Exactly. And that that was going to be the north, northern route. Exactly. And so the Columbia River was going to be a highway and not just a, the port where Astoria yes. was going to be found. Yeah. So they, they thought that would be possible. But in, in some ways, I didn't know they said God wouldn't have made this continent without Northwest Passage <laughs> because they truly believed that there had to be a route as the near the cross. Well, but, but by the early 19th century, David Thompson and others had figured out that Columbia did not transcend the Rocky Mountain Range. So early, early on, they knew that it wasn't going to work out. The fabled Northwest Passage was not going to be. I think it was debated, still being debated. But they did somehow to mention you. Well, so we're ending the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> So let me say, say thanks, Andre. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.